a roll of drums heralds the Uganda national anthem, and our flag is raised. October the 9th, 1962, Uganda attains independence. Uganda is independent. A fledgling nation with enormous economic potential. The agriculture sector dominated by coffee, cotton, tea growing and processing. The rapid expansion of the industrial sector. The mineral exploitation with copper at Kilembe mines in Kasese as the most important economic activity in this sector. Numerous private and public economic enterprises that drew in substantial human resource in form of employment to run them. By the late 1960s, this labor force had grown tremendously, prompting government to pass legislation aiming at providing for a retirement benefit scheme to cater for workers in private companies and parastatal enterprises, since civil servants were already covered under government pension. Retired civil servant James Baira was at the time working in the Ministry of Labor. He witnessed the introduction and subsequent implementation of the retirement scheme that was named Social Security Fund. The pension was covered in a certain category of, of, of government staff only. And uh, some other organizations like universities, uh, private bodies, some private firms that have some other saving schemes, but uh, different, differing from place to place. But uh, it was decided, I think, there should be one uniform scheme to cover all employees. On September 26, 1967, Parliament passed the 1967 Act, the legislation that provided for the establishment of Social Security Fund scheme and formed a department in the Ministry of Labor. Briefly, it only said uh, every organizing, every organization employing at least five should be covered. The members who are registered with the Social Security uh, were contributing 5%, which I think is still the same the case. And uh, the employers also contributed 5%. So a total of 10% would go to the saving of the worker who is registered. In 1971, Idi Amin seized power in a military coup. For the next eight years, Uganda was under military rule. A period that was characterized by gross economic mismanagement following the expulsion of Asians who had dominated all sectors of the country's economy. The majority of employers in the private sector were Asians who left. And when they left, the military leaders took over, like states, factories, and uh, they were mismanaged thereafter. As you are aware, uh, they were drained, and uh, so that introduced the labor force. Idi Amin issued the 1972 Social Security Decree, which provided for withdrawal of benefits from the fund in certain cases. It also made provisions for the fund's board of trustees. By 1981, the Social Security Fund was being housed in Ambassador House on Plot 5660 Kampala Road, still as a department in the Ministry of Labor. It had steadily recovered from the Idi Amin economic crisis of the 70s. By 1981-82 financial year, annual contributions were 76.2 million shillings, and the Fund realized a total of 62 million shillings as income from investments. The Social Security Fund was buying treasury bills that were the safest and lucrative really saving scheme where the money would be sure it is not really stolen anyway. Every district of Uganda Plans to transform the Social Security Fund into an autonomous public parastatal body were revealed by then-President Milton Obote in May 1981 during the Labor Day celebrations. Meanwhile, new members were being registered and it showed an upward trend from 13,836 members registered in 1982 to 17,444 members registered in 1984. Uh, I steered a committee that drafted the law 
to change it in the Borisato body to establish a national social security fund. What it is now. So the minister had cleared it uh, with the permanent secretary administratively, and then uh, the bill was t was taken to the cabinet, and then the cabinet approved, and it went to the parliament. And uh, before I mean, it was our boat was toppled, he had signed the act. The 1985 act had made the uh, National Social Security Fund an independent parastato, but it had not been operationalized. There were about 180 people working there, and I retired all of them and sent them back to the government, in the Ministry of Labor. I asked some of them to reapply. Um, we recruited other people, and we put up an advert for the recruitment of uh, a managing director. We got very good applicants, and we got Professor Barongo from the university and uh, Mr. Abel Katembe. They both scored same marks, so I exercised the casting vote and gave it to Mr. Abel Katembe. The management embarked on the uphill task of revitalizing the FAND by implementing and enforcing the 1985 Act. We realized that the amount of money that was being collected was very little. I mean, they were collecting about 50 million shillings per month. And that we, we also found out that that first 50 million shillings was just about enough to pay salaries of the, of the employees. So they were co collecting contributions and consuming. And I can tell you, if I remember very well, the benefits they were paying in a whole year was about 1.9 million shillings. We actually carried out a nationwide effort to sensitize workers to the concept of social security. I personally visited all the sugar estates all the tea estates, and I was working closely with the trade unions. The newly formed fund setup was however thrown into a setback when government in 1987 announced currency devaluation. When the shilling was reduced to a hundredth of its face value and a conversion rate of 30% was imposed, the fund savings of 1.8 billion shillings were reduced to 34 million shillings. Members who had contributed to the fund for 20 years at a rate of 80 shillings per month found themselves with only 154 shillings on their accounts. Mary Namungoma, who had joined the fund in 1985 as a higher executive officer accounts, witnessed the setback. Because as days two zeros were taken off, it meant that as claimants were claiming their money, the contributors, the true zeros were put in consideration and also the 30% conversion tax. And yet at that time investments were almost not there. The members would almost get less than what they had contributed. It was even too small that when one would get the money, really holding your savings in coins, I think it was not giving a good impression. In spite of this setback, NSSF decided to prioritize investment. Considering the trickling in of contributions from the members, choosing to continue investing in treasury bills as a short-term form of investment was deemed the best option for the start. We said we have to invest first of all in treasury bills, government bonds, those were very secure. We couldn't risk in long term, uh, investing in long-term funds, like housing, like because you know the economy was still a bit fluid. If you look, look at 1986, up to 1996, investment climate was not all that uh, uh, conducive and was not very, very clear. Following this development, the fund secured some more money with which they used to buy this property at Plot 22 Lumumba Avenue. The fan subsequently vacated the rented offices on Kampala Road and moved into their newly acquired offices. Private individuals started claiming their, their buildings and the business community claimed that that building was there. So they wanted to evict NSSF out and the fund had some money and it wanted to do some other investments. They acquired Buildings on Lumumba Avenue, that is where NSSF moved. 
By 1992, with slightly improved financial muscle, the fund acquired 16 maisonettes from National Housing and Construction Corporation at a cost of 1.2 billion shillings. We decided that we will not use this money under political influence, but we will buy the Bukoto houses, which were just being finished by National Housing Construction Corporation. And there would be no commissions, there would be nobody earning any money out of it. This landmark purchase kick-started NSSF's move into investing members' contributions into real estate. In 1994, the fan took a giant investment leap into reviving the ambitious project of building a workers' house, an idea that had been developed in the late 1980s. Now, workers' house was conceived before we came in. But when we came in, we found Steve coming out of the ground. Now, the visionaries at that time wanted to build a property where the workers' money could generate income for the workers. It was a very, very commendable thing. And unfortunately, through tendering failures and a bad economic situation, the bad environment, nothing really took off. Management sat down together with the other stakeholders, with the board, and we decided that it is time now to resuscitate, to revive the, you know, the workers' house. We knew there, was, there were going to be incredible challenges. For instance, we did not know whether that building was still safe. Construction resumed in 1998 by Roku Construction after a period of two years. And on Labor Day, May 1st, 2001, a brand new 14-storey tower that redefined Kampala skyline was commissioned by President Yoram Seveni. I have the honor to officially open Workers' House. Thank you. Today, the building that was constructed at a cost of 36 billion shillings is an important source of income, fetching the fund 10 billion shillings annually, accrued from 34 tenants. The following year, 2000, NSSF acquired yet another commercial property located on Ginger Road. Formerly known as UDM House, the five-floor building, which cost 9.8 billion shillings, fetches the fund an annual average income of 6 billion shillings, collected from 37 tenants. Our policy is that with the commercial, which is your office rental, and retail, which is your, uh, which is your, your, your shops, we would rent those out and continue to hold them on our portfolio. And fortunately, in some cases, this rapid investment drive came with its own negative effects. Some of the real estate properties which were acquired raised queries on the process and amount of monies that were spent. These allegations of corruption and financial mismanagement compelled the president's intervention. In September 2004, he ordered for the transfer of NSSF from the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development to the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development. The Ministry of Labor has no financial training, has no financial capacity to handle uh, money of that magnitude. So therefore, it was thought appropriate that we move the fund from the uh, Ministry of Labor and transfer to, to Minister of Finance among the experts about, about money. Following this restructuring in 2005, NSSF launched an integrated management information system to facilitate the efficient management of its core business processes. All processes from registration, contribution collection, financial management, as well as payment of benefits were integrated into the new system. The same year, the system was decentralized to all NSSF area offices by installation of a wide area network. As part of the IMIS launch, NSSF embarked on a nationwide re-registration campaign of all employers and employees. The objective of the re-registration was to obtain foolproof biometric information for convenient and prompt identification of members, to update and clean member records, and to give members a new electronic membership card. The automation of the identification system went a long way in improving NSSF's efficiency, enabling the fan to settle on average 1,200 claims monthly with a tremendous turnaround time for benefits processing. It used to take about three months on average to actually get that money, by which time you're probably dead. But now, 
uh, we actually take on average 10 days and we are looking to reduce that now to about five days. In fact, some members get their money in about three days. The contract for the first phase of the pension towers, Kampala's most iconic structure on Lumumba Avenue in Nakasero, was awarded to Roku Construction Limited in 2008 and work kicked off with groundbreaking in 2009. The towers are located on land covering 18 acres on plots 15A, 15B and 17 along Lumumba Avenue. The first phase of the project was completed in 2012. Plans to proceed to the next stage are underway. We had already sunk in about 50 billion shillings, uh, which took us to the fourth floor of the basement. Uh, and um, as a result of the PPD rules, we needed to go back to the market to find a contractor who would then take that to the top to the top end of the, of the floors. NSSF owns 565 acres of land on plot 1058, block 269 in Luboa, Wakiso district, that the fan purchased in 2003. The fan is planning to construct about 3,000 housing units. The project, which will cost an estimated 400 million US dollars over a 10 year period, will be one of the most upmarket housing estates in Uganda. The project will not only deliver an environmentally friendly estate with the associated social amenities, but will also make a major contribution to the reduction of the housing deficit currently faced by the country. In April 2015, Luboa Housing Project Design Master Plan won the Environmental Sustainability Award at the first East Africa Green Building Conference held in Arusha, Tanzania. In March 2008, NSSF acquired 463.87 acres of land at Temangalo in Wakiso district at 11.2 billion shillings. The fund has developed a grant plan to develop it for a specific clientele. We are looking at uh, the lower end of the market and uh, we've already identified six pieces of technology which we'll use to bring the cost of construction down so that we can create affordable houses. The affordable houses hopefully should come onto the market uh, beginning 2017-2018. NSSF is the leading investor on the Uganda Securities Exchange. It holds 16% of USE traded securities. Starting with Uganda Clays in 2000, where it bought 32.51% shares, the fund went ahead to invest in almost all the equities listed on Uganda Stock Exchange, and its impact has been tremendous. We've seen a lot more liquidity and activity from NSF, and uh, the exchange has actually earned a good share of uh, revenue through transactions that NSF has done because they're quite large. The fund's decision to invest 70 billion shillings in Umeme, accounting for 14.27% of the company's shares floated on the stock exchange, was no doubt a wise foresight that has paid off handsomely. That 70 billion then, if you went to the stock market now to offload those shares or sell those shares, they are worth 150 billion shillings. So they are more than doubled in value over three years, which gives you an average return of around 38%. Okay? The second element is uh, Umeme Noma does what we call distributions, dividends. From 2013 to the, by the end of 2015, we shall have distributed to NSSF 16 billion shillings. Now, if you take 16 billion shillings over the 70 billion they invested, that gives an average return of 23% over the three years, which is an average return of 7%. So when you combine the capital gains on their shares, right, plus the dividends they have gotten, it gives a combined return over the three years of 137%, which is an annual return of 46% per annum. I can bet you not even any bank, not even the treasury bills will give you such a return. So for me, I look at it as an... As uh, my shareholder, they have got the best deal. In addition, NSSF's investment in Umeme has substantially contributed to increasing the country's power capacity and distribution. Using that credence of the stock markets, we went out and did the fundraising of $190 million of private money, which we have invested into the country. Our Yaka rollout prepayment is at 50%. You have seen a lot of refurbishment of lines. We are building substations. All those benefits come from Umeme investing, 
And that investment was again driven by listing of the stock exchange, which attracted NSSF, which again attracted more money into the company. Undoubtedly, NSSF is a mover and shaker of Uganda's economy. It has invested 3 trillion shillings in government securities and placed approximately 661 billion shillings as fixed deposits with local banks, which constitutes 14% of all bank deposits, making it the largest financial institution in the country. The real value of NSSF's nominal assets is the most important investment of the NSSF. And consequently, the very fact that we have uh, maintained this value against inflation expectations is a very important contribution. Indeed, the FAND is moving with the global technological advancements as evidenced in the electronic innovations like e-statement access and mobile apps that make it easy for it to interface with its members all the time and from wherever they may be. The team of 20 staff is divided into three sections handling internal users, the branches and applications respectively. Access to the 21 branches across the country with associated 51 outreach centers serving over 1.5 million clients has been made easy with the technological innovations. Today, all branches are 24 hours online, linked via LeaseLine, making it a real-time connection. In 2012, NSSF relaunched with new promises. Among them was unveiling a new corporate identity that was accentuated with a refreshed blue and green logo, as well as a new tagline. The new logo symbolized the fans' renewed commitment to be even more relevant to its members after over 28 years as the lone social security provider in the pension sector with 73% compliance. The statement we are trying to make is that we are new uh, entity now. We are fresh. We have new offerings, new customer service, and therefore, to reflect those values and those deliverables, we had to actually bring a new face to the public. The relaunch coincided with the monumental growth of the fans' asset base to a historic three trillion as at the end of November 2012. By 2015, the annual contribution stands at 688 billion shillings. And this phenomenal growth is attributed to a dedicated, well-motivated workforce of over 400 staff that has worked hard to improve the image of NSSF as they deliver exemplary services to the members as well as prudent management of their savings. If you ensure that you have got merit-based uh, recruitment of your staff, you well-skilled, you continue to train them, you empower them, you motivate them, you get the good satisfaction ratings, and you continue to improve, work with them, then that means that they will deliver a good service. This exceptional management capability is overseen and guided by a board comprising ladies and gentlemen of high integrity, representing government, the workers and employers. And all those major three stakeholders are represented on the board of directors for good corporate governance, to give good direction, uh, and the strategy and oversight uh, to the institution. Now, when you have that kind of arrangement as a tripartite, there's a lot of trust amongst ourselves. And when you are at the body level, of course, you are the owner of, 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 of the institution. Then the management, you, you, you put in the management team you, 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 you would like to see. So that is the trust now we have. On September 29, 2015, the fund declared an interest rate of 13% to its members for the financial year 2014-2015. This marked four consecutive years of double-digit interest rate declaration that beats the average 10-year inflation. This development affirms NSSF's commitment to prudent management of members' funds, assuring them of a better retirement future. By the end of 2015, the total number of members who have received their benefits in the last eight years stood at 91,386, accounting for 649 billion shillings. Jackson Oponya and Helen Oponya are a couple living in Gulu. 
They are members of the fund who received their benefits after retirement, pulled it together and invested it in a school, St. John Paul II, a mixed secondary boarding school in Gulu, which the couple had started while still in employment. The first benefits I got in 2005 came at a time when we were running sort of funds as a family. And uh, I invested all of that money in building a classroom block. Three more years round down the road, I got the second installment. Specifically, we used it to construct a girl's dormitory. We knew that we had to retire from service and come home. Come home to what? Especially after the war when there was absolutely nothing. So we said, no, this is a lump sum of money which we are getting. We should boost the school which we have started. Number 16, which of the following is the Today, St. John Paul College with a 1,055 student enrollment ranks among top schools in the region and the couple have no regrets for having contributed to NSSF for the better future they're enjoying now. Uh, in, in paid employment, any employee when that time comes for retirement must get some form of benefit. And uh, in most cases, employers, based on my experience as a senior person who worked in many corporations, the employer will not have that money. And so the best way out is to ensure that the employee contributes collectively with the employer. After working as a school finance administrator and making contribution for three years, Ruth Wakari received her benefits of 5 million shillings, contrary to what skeptics had told her she would never get it. She couldn't contain her excitement when she went to the bank. Oh, dear Lord Jesus, when I reached there, they told me, your money, <laughs> your money has come. I screamed. And this is the people, they were saying what is happening to this lady, but it was because of the happiness. She invested it in construction of one-room department rentals at her home in Nakabago village, Mukono. Saving with NSSF, you benefit later on. Yeah, because now as old as I am, by putting those ones, I know, yeah, my future is okay. Although he's still employed, Reverend Christopher Tugumahawe couldn't wait to build his dream house in Kawale town using part of his benefits, which he accessed after cloaking 55. When I applied, they gave me my benefits, uh, close to 10 million and plus. And I started saying I had bought this land and I wanted to put my house, which I thought I should retire in. I used major a big amount to raise up the the, 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 the house. Besides the house, Christopher decided to spread his investment by venturing into tree planting on a four-acre piece of land which he acquired deep in the countryside. Investing my little money that I had into tree planting would help me to get raise more money in the future which would help me also do something else bigger. These are examples of thousands of members of NSSF who received their benefits and have wisely used it to build themselves comfortable retirement. Besides managing to remain the leading saving institution in the country overseeing contributions for 1.5 million workers countrywide, the FAND has won local and international accolades for its remarkable performance, including the prestigious African Pension Leadership Initiative of the Year Award, 2015. The growth and achievements over the last 30 years are testimony enough to NSSF's enormous economic potential on its members, let alone Uganda as a country. For the fund's management, the sky is the limit. We want to be uh, the iconic pension provider of, uh, uh, of service uh, in this region. Uh, we would like to surpass everybody in terms of all measures, all right? At the, at the moment, we are the largest in value, but would like to be the largest in terms of our application to the economy. We want to be able to take on uh, and benchmark ourselves against the best. You know, the Singapore uh, comes to mind, uh, the Malaysian pension schemes. Uh, they, they, they were our size, you know, a couple of decades ago. Uh, we would like to get into that sort of league. We would like to be um, the provider uh, of... Uh, of, of, uh, of uh, finance to infrastructure. We know that Uganda has a huge requirement in terms of infrastructure. We think that uh, all those measures that we are putting in place that I've enumerated 
will help us to become the social security provider of choice, certainly within Uganda and within the African region. Indeed, a solid foundation has been set to uphold and continue focusing on fulfilling the NSF's mission of securing a better life for the fans' growing membership by providing quality products, great customer service, and offering competitive returns in a transparent and efficient environment.